It was a sun that slanted long and low at the edge of the pines. It was a soft breeze lifting the scent of grass, just mowed, drying in the distant field, waiting to be bound, made into rectangles, stacked. What can I do but pedal away faster? I don't look back, not once. You've got to make hay when the sun shines, say the old timers. I make the hay sway. I make the wasps retreat back to their nests. Or I make him cry and wail. Rock beats scissors. Scissors beats paper. Paper beats rock. I let wasps beat up my little brother because I don't pull him away. I don't yell, pick up your bike, run. My lungs load with panic, no release, because I don't take his chubby hands, run with him towards the house to the stone steps, don't implore him to save himself. I see his face, still puffy, wasps sting again and again, they're the ones who won't die after just one stabbing. So they tickle him, they caress his skin, they stroke him like soft gusts lift leaves, make shadows play on the lemonade glasses set out for the men coming in from haying in the hot fields. Each glass glistens, the ice dissolving back into its original form, liquid pooling on the glass tabletop. It's true, the wasps found their way down his shirt, Later, we have to paint his back pink to cover up the redness, the blotchy raised welts. Later, we have to go back to get his bike, resting where he flung it on its side, pedals still. Lament for some other Saigon. My father taught me feet are something to care for, cradle. He won't talk about his time in Nam. I remind people his age too much of hot, sticky, green foliage flapping in their faces or steam rising up from rice paddies the platoons wade, waded through all morning, crossing in the open, barrels loaded, sighted, ready for a fight. Yellow roses, that is what they sent home to their wives to shrivel in glass faces. My face, a big yellow moon, rises in their nightmares, my face a howling monkey, a ripe watermelon, watermelon rind grinning back at them. Or perhaps it's my hair that troubles them, black braid bouncing with the rocking movements of the swing, whose hand sears its own shape on my skin. My skin will turn to crisp brown under any sun. My eyes will holster any loaded rifle. My father is an ant moving through tall grass, boots filling with mud and muck. He never talks about anything else. He's the slap of the wind hitting my face. His yellow balloon silence is what fills the room, but I'm the air taking up the space between his rib cage. A face like mine walks among others in his dreams. Caspian Lake for AKNR. Look, no stare at the moon's tracked surface. Moon dew forms in the air. These gray days I want. No prince from Narnia, no Turkish delight. Bright suited bodies jump in and out. Dogs prowl for scraps, tans border on burnt. The scent of sunscreen is coconut and sour. We watch others repeat our own childhoods. Window panes divide the view of the lake into sections, how to have the world. We leave them ajar so the loon's calls carry an echo at night inside our bedrooms in the summer cottage. What if we popped all the beach balls at exactly the same time, pinpricks violent with precision, the shape of air made visible, and lake time isn't real time, she says. The clouds seem to expand unending. Caspian, the shape of the lake named for the drying up distant sea. The engine for the unfocused mind. My dearest friends cannot have a child. Someone else's belly pushes ahead of her, water rippling out in front. 
concentric circles eventually touch the shoreline. Rotund is a perfect word. Her round, roundness arrives in the space an instant before her, wherever she goes. They ask me to write a letter in defense of their future adoption. I am a good friend, so I do it. Perhaps it is important to know the things one doesn't want. Make a list. Caspian is dried up, salt residue, all that's left of an entire sea. Lies, I might tell, for sympathy. The body, when retaining water, will contain blood low in sodium. My mother's doctor tells her to limit her water intake to one-fourth cup a day. Her lungs are crenulated, vast seas. Why can't bodies who want smaller bodies inside them have them? When I let the water take over for gravity and I float in the middle of the lake, I am the X inside a body. This lake is not a metaphor. It is a place I love. Still life with watermelon seeds, mannequin, dead mouse. Serrated edge flash, flash shards of light on white walls, carving up the watermelon slices that drip down our thin brown arms. My father salts his pink slice smiles, tiny grains melt in, a neon sign in my mouth, this shock of fruit flesh. Don't swallow the seeds, he warns, and I want to so bad and I'm bad. Under the covers, eyes shut, I see twisted vines tumble, roots embed in my stomach's black, New green shoots slide over my pink tongue, thick. We spit out the slippery seeds onto the stone patio. The summer night air quivers and the gash on her left knee pulses. Watch third person shift focus. So barely scabbed over, she'll dig up palms from dirt. She'll run all those races. She's not split, not the furry body opened on its side, tail limp. She's not the mouse's intestine peeping out. She's not the one that glistens, the cat's claw, the hawk's talon. What flourishes withers in the heat. In the photograph, <coughs> all seated in a row on the front porch of the log cabin, bodies pixelated, the mannequin next to her, I mean next to me, is some joke no one gets. A plastic copy of another body, a jab, perhaps, at my mother. Blonde wig and lush lashes pop propped up next to the father on the stoop, right there. We know what comes next from practice. Drag the coiled green hose from the side of the house to wash away the seeds. Um... So Landlock X is divided into three sections. Um, and the book opens um, with a handwritten letter. And the handwritten letter is from um, the poets, i.e. me, its biological father. Um, and the, the point of having the book open with these two images of the letter is I wanted the book to um, open up for a reader with, uh, from a point of disorientation from the beginning. So if you're engaging with the text, you open it, you flip through the table of contents, and then you come across these um, two handwritten um, pages that I can't read. And I'm, and I'm also assuming that unless you're a Korean speaker or, or someone of Korean speaking or writing, that um, uh, the reader won't, won't know how to read it as well. Um, so then the book is divided into three sections called Field, Dress, Portal, which is also the title of one of the poems in the second section. Um, and each section has, a, has an erasure of the English translation. So um, in, 2000, in 2013, 
uh, I received uh, the handwritten letter, the English translation, and a photograph of my biological father f via email. Um, so the English, the erasures, or what erasures do in poetry is that you can redact things. It's, in, it's working with a text so you can, you can push some things back and push other things forward. And it's, it's the, the idea of making something from something that's given to you and, and transforming it. Um, so there are three erasures of the English translation in, in, in the book, one in each section. Um, the first one has just a series of eyes. So all the um, uppercase eyes and all the lowercase eyes are bolded and pulled forward and everything else is pushed back. You can still read the actual text, so you can actually um, experience the, the translation. Um, but it's, if I read it, it would be I, 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 I. Um, and then the, the center translation uh, erasure um, pulls out the eyes and also some of the words. So it's more of like an a, a, like a actual erasure poem. And then the third one um, uh, pulls out all the U's. So the word Y-O-U and then the letter U. So it's U, 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 U. Um, and in this process, I am, and throughout the book, I'm very interested in the agency um, and point of view. So the pronouns become interesting to look at the first person speaker, the I, the you, the second person speaker. Sometimes the you can be a slippery, it can be a self-reflective you, um, or it can be a direct address you to the reader. Um, and nowhere in the English translation and, or in the original letter is there ever a we. Um, and I also, because the book is divided into three sections and there are three uh, erasures, it's also a triptych. Mm -hmm. So the eyes are the eyes are here and the U's are here and they fold in on the center um, the center panel, if you will, if you're looking at a triptych painting. Um, so that's the construction of the book. And the book closes with um, a collage, a full color collage and uh, anyone in the po po biz, poetry business knows that it's very difficult to get artwork yeah. in your in your um, published in your in your book, and also it's very difficult to like get things published in color because it's more expensive to print. Um, but when I was working with the press, Texas Review Press, um, I asked them if it would be possible, and they said yes. Um, I also got a larger format book. Typically, poetry collections are narrower, but my work has really long lines and unconventional, um, some unconventional formatting. Um, so the long lines are in a small, slimmer formatted book would be um, in jammed on the next line. And um, I asked, also asked for a larger format book. So I got everything I wanted. <laughs> Um, and I also got uh, the cover art. Um, the cover art is by um, Nancy Kim, who is a Korean American artist who lives in Italy, who I met um, at Vermont Studio Center while I, while I was working there. I'm still working there now. Um, and it's, we also did a text a photo wrap, so the cover wraps. Um, and we were also, Typically, in a poetry collection, you have all the, the book blurbs on the back, and then you have like the author f photo and the author bio. And we wanted to main maintain the integrity of the image, so we, we wrapped the image around the cover and then inserted um, the rest of the book and only included one book blurb on the back and inserted the, the other book blurbs on the inside. And then... Um, I still wanted my face in the book because I felt like that was really important to the, the book itself to make sure that um, a reader knows that, that I am a person of color writing these poems. And um, because my name, Sarah Oddsley, isn't necessarily glossed as um, an Asian name. So I did, I, we, I asked, I also asked, like, can you put um, the photo and the bio on the inside? Um, so I was, I was very 
um, lucky to be able to work with the press and to, for them to accommodate me with all those things. But um, Joan was asking about waiting children, and I typically won't don't read this, and I actually probably won't read it. Um, but what it is is um, my parents kept all my adoption paperwork in a file file folder in a file cabinet in the basement, um, and I asked for the papers because I I wanted to work with them. Um, and look at them and, and engage with them as, as text. Um, and one of the pieces of paper that were in the files was um, a folded, uh, one of those like bulletins that you get in the mail, like a fold, folded um, paper news bulletin. And um, it, want, it had my, my, the announcement of my adoption. So it was from like spring of, I don't know, it was like 94 or something. And then it also had, when you opened it, it had a page. So you turn the page and there was like other text in it. But then you turn the page and there was a two page spread of waiting children who are waiting to be adopted. And so it was a very striking image to me. Um, and it was children that he, some of them had deformities, some of, typical, most of them were older children. Um, pe people normally don't want to ha adopt uh, older dogs or older kids. Um, and then also they were grouped, some of them had, were siblings. So um, these two are brothers, so they have the same flower. This was a family of three kids. Um, this girl had a, a gash on her forehead, and this was a, a a uh, older daughter and a, I mean, older sister and a, a younger brother. This one's a baby, and there's um, also there were a couple babies in this. So, I'm pushing against the idea of shopping for children and shopping for flowers and what you you end up planting in your garden. Um, so the original image had um, I was it's a collage work, so I was cutting out. Um, flowers from shopping, uh, from gardening catalogs, and I was paste. I pa physically pasted them onto the the original document. What I realized is that um, I had tons of flowers on my cell phone. Like I take a lot of photos of plants and flowers, mm -hmm. so I emailed myself all of these flowers, <laughs> and then I um, photoshopped them over the uh, uh, JPEG image. So at and so, at, and, and it actually is really lovely that um, all of the flowers that ended up being in the collage are, f are flowers that, um, that are dear to me in some way. The half-sister unmet. Paint the edges of an unimagined an life in a foreign tongue, in a land rich in exotics, silk hom books, piled high beaded pearl hair pieces, tea ceremonies, swallowing odd animal eggs, exotic because it's over there, inappropriate, of course, for fetishizing the other. I am performing. Let's say, how inadequate. My fecundity swells up sudden, a heavy perfume at the apex before the slope to decay. Our heads nestled on one pillow, we might have whispered to each other tiny confessions of who we lusted after, even loved, sisters, secret keepers. Probably we would have hated each other. By making art, by making poems, um, we, actually, we actually create something that is based on some autobiographical truth, um, but it is then therefore transformed. Um, so if someone reads my book, they will learn and assume that they are learning uh, many autobiographical things about the speaker or the author, or the poet. Um, and I just like reminding people that um, it, poets lie <laughs> um, and that, that, that the crafting of the work in the best way is to serve the poem, to make art. So this poem is placed at the Museum of Everyday Life. 
And these two poems are going to be published in the Massachusetts Review in the fall, which I'm really excited about. And I'm very grateful to Nathan McLean, who is the poetry editor there and a friend. Um, and oh, yeah, yeah. He helped. He helped me get this one, um, tight, tighten this one up. So shout out to Nathan McLean, and the Massachusetts Review. So at the Museum of Everyday Life. At the Museum of Everyday Life, the theme this month: scissors. Last month: knots. From the plinths in our hands, storks slide their legs back and forth, make tiny cuts of air and mimic striding, lifting their laden beaks, deliberate movements and upward charge into a darkened sky, wings full blown. When you're serious about your sewing and crafting, you should be serious about your cutting too. Stork scissors, birds, molded thin blades, as beaks, their eyes a screw at the pivot point, each body the curvature of handles, the legs rounded holes, one for thumb, one for pointer and middle. The result? Scissors and shears of uncompromising quality that will bring you years of cutting pleasure. Dear metal birds, tell us the difference in feeling between cutting fabric or flesh about the midwives who carried you in their kits, blades through the slick of newness, the skin's first brush with oxygen, cut of the cord, a silent slip, s silent snip. Take wholeness and pull it apart to codify a sum of parts. Tell us so that I can fly forth, so I can individuate from the flock and with this act of separation, take flight from any vantage, which is to say, if I break my habit of believing in the myths, in babies born to mothers from storks, in metaphor at all, what could be different? What might make sense? As I mentioned earlier with the first poem, I, I grew up with um, uh, some farming in my childhood. My grandmother had chickens and we had a, a garden. We had, obviously we had haying. We also had meat cows. So we had um, the white, white faced cows with the brown bodies. Um, so this, is, this poem starts in that childhood memory mode, but then turns. So it's called On Calving. Calving. On Calving. The door handle smooth from rough hands, opening and closing, a camera's shutter on the scene. The round brown heifer calving on her own in deep night without help. Her, her warm slick clumps, two inch sawdust stains the barnwood floor. I shame quake in this child dream. An alien form afraid of its newness, the smell I remember the men beckoned me closer to witness the calf stand on its own. How seldom to wonder is its own category, its own box to check off, a to-do to classify as accomplishment. Instead, we follow directions, believe in myth-making, alternative facts, progress. So, I believe the newborn, nose tugged at the mother's teat, the way my mouth never pulled on, nipple begged the body. Then let me wonder at light particles, the Milky Way, lacrimal ducks, how my eyes spark when you appear, ghost mother, when I thought you were what I had to let go. The future is here. Veal, so tender, battered, and served on cruises to tourists who clink champagne and chew as they watch the glaciers quicken with the warming, the slow-moving turbine, turbines pumping and invisible under a tonnage of water. Earlier I mentioned how uh, the book is interested in agency and pronouns. There's like the I, and then there's the you and the erasures, and sometimes there's a third person, there's the she, which is like trying to deflect a little bit of the first person to shift it into third person mode. Um, and then um, I really wanted to write a poem 
from the collective voice, from the we, um, to try to think about a collective of uh, adoptees, um, my fellow adoptees. And um, I found it, it, I still find it difficult to write from the we, from a collective voice. Um, so this poem was an exercise in that um, and, and kind of bringing in um, the thinking about the just and making a gesture to the collective. Um, oh, and it also references um, an event that happened in real life in October 1998. 29 ad uh, Korean ad uh, adoptees were invited back to the Blue House, which is uh, like the White House in, in South Korea, for a formal apology from the president. So, um, I find very interesting. So the poem also is a gesture to that real life event. So it's called We or In the Blue House. We or In the Blue House. Invitations were sent to the first of our kind. All is behind us. Come home, child. The painter's commission for bluing imported goldenrod to match the house's walls, allows him to rest and eat his fill for months after. We find the other children lost in the trees. We are apologies made to us, and what we eat glistens as portions of ourselves proclaim a repetition of longing. We only knew we were golden when, when we knew we could eat the land, lock ourselves in X. The bees died over winter in their stiff boxes. Each moon was a flipped rabbit in orbit and barcodes on our necks dissolved, no imprints left. We strangers touch the land with our feet and spook the deer back home. Those who make their own light invent the proportions they desire. We are our own natural selection. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming.